Hello. Uh, thank you for being here. My name is Roman Schönebohm, if you want to try the last name. I'm senior service designer, and today I'm going to talk about a change story. Um, uh, I just wanted to point out there are a couple of slides in there which have a little sign on the right top corner saying no photos, please. I'm here to share uh, the work we did, but uh, not supposed to be uh, taken photos of, so thank you. Um, I work as senior service designer uh, for Tesco, um, third largest retailer in the world, operating in eight different countries. And uh, we are actually the biggest employer in the UK with 300,000 people. So it's a massive, massive organization who needs support. Um, as a team, we started our journey collectively 20 months ago, uh, January 2016. Um, we planned, we tested, we iterated, we moved in the first year from showing, not telling approach to the second year of a state of demand and then a systemization of tools and processes. And we set ourselves as a team a three year um, period where we said we, we try to see what happens within three years. So the third year was actually um, scaling up the processes and tools and then uh, measure that against the KPIs we had and also trying hopefully to see a business culture change. So I'm giving you a couple of examples throughout the talk um, for that. Um, the digital customer experience team where I was part of started actually quite small. So just a couple of people here. Um, from head of design, communication manager, and two service designers. We started more of a vision, a service design-led transformation program to put the customer at the heart of the design process. As a team, we've been part of a very big organization. So uh, the bigger um, circle here in gray uh, is a representation of all the employees in the UK, 300,000, and then within the second biggest circle are the leadership and management function, which is roughly 5,000 people. And within that, you have many different groups with different sizes and multiple names. One of the group is the digital product group. So that tes that's Tesco's um, digital product group here in the UK. And part of that group was the DCE team with just two service designers. So if you want to deliver a holistic change and you start with two service designers, that's a nice challenge to have. So 75% of companies saying they're transforming their business or doing it already, but only 10% are successful due to a lack of an holistic process which service design brings. We had no holistic process at the beginning, so it was a difficult start, and we started something like this, that as a service designer, you are to the business what a new donor organ is to the body. You first get rejected, and it takes actually time to become part of the actual um, system. That's why the first insight I want to share with you is service design is easy to love, uh, but hard to sell. And this means you need to have um, an ambassador or a champion pushing um, all the work forward, um, someone who owns the work as well and helps other teams to adopt it. You need to connect the business needs you find through research with um, the user needs to get senior management buy-in. If they don't see that it's valuable for the business, they probably won't support you. And you need to use projects uh, for show and tell purposes. So the first project was that we helped the business to understand uh, and map the customer experience they had. We focused on an online experience. We created um, these uh, customer journey maps, mapped out all the stages uh, all the people involved, the touch points, the needs, the pain points, the data we know, um, as well as the insights. And this was a great tool for us to help the business understand where we can prioritize. So this little example here is the building basket stage and visually it shows there are a lot of needs on top, there are a lot of pain points related to it, but the data might tell us that within that particular process step, people, 3% of our customers just do a very specific thing. So the priority for us to solve that straight away is actually low. So the process was interesting and created a lot of demand. People started to understand what we can offer in terms of value as a team. And that's why 
we had to grow the team a bit, so we added a couple of more specialties. Uh, I think we ended up with 25 people, still small, but I thought it was very efficient. And we moved from a vision more to a practice team, a team which enabled other teams and colleagues to understand how to put the customer at the heart of their daily work while offering training and support and products and the right setup to do so. Insight here is that the transformation is a process, so whatever you want to call it, uh, service design, CX, uh, um, cu customer experience, design thinking, user experience, there are many buzzwords. Uh, it's clear it takes time, but it really pays out to invest that time. And I found a graph here, um, which I just narrowed down a bit. So what this shows is um, we have on the left-hand scale the money and here on the horizontal scale the time. We can see uh, with the gray um, graph the S&P 500 index, so that's the Standard & Poor Company 500 index. And then on top of it we have the Design Management Institute Design Centric Index. And what this shows is that uh, companies who invest into design um, will outperform um, standard and poor 500 companies by 228 percent. And the interest, most interesting bit is that actually the f at the beginning they are quite similar, uh, which is the first five years. So it actually takes a minimum of three to five years uh, until the investment in design actually really kicks off. And that's why Apple and Coca-Cola and IBM and all the other companies are now so successful and really competitive at the market because they've already been at the stage to invest into um, design centricity, customer centricity a couple of years back. So you should use real projects to sell the process and the tools you uh, do that in order for the company to invest into design. And we did that with a research project which we called Post Family Research. Uh, we designed services to help the post-family customers to save money on their groceries. Post-family customers for us were 55 plus. Um, we showed the business how to do real research. When we went out to talk to people, we used um, templates and tools we created to capture all the insights and the knowledge. And then we analyzed all of this and played it back to a big group of people mixed from um, facilitators, uh, call center people, in-store people, designers, real customers in a big co-creation workshop. And once we had um, prioritized um, concepts, we then uh, presented that back at the stakeholder walkthrough and an evaluation session with our experts because we partnered up with HUK just to make sure we are on the right track with the, with the research. And we chose that project for a reason because it was a wicked customer challenge. So uh, Tesco currently underserves the needs of the 55 plus people. It was a clear business need. So we're losing this group fast in comparison to other groups like smaller families or single people. And they ac actually account for a very high percentage of our profit. And we use this as an opportunity to demonstrate best practice. So we showed them how to do it. We did not tell them. So it's all about sharing your insights and your tools. And uh, we did that with a customer needs library and the service design playbook. Customer needs library, when we did the research, we had a lot of um, insights, um, a lot of needs from our customers. And we thought, how could we um, make that available to other teams? If they have similar issues, they need to have a, a platform or search function or something like this. So we built this little prototype called the customer needs library. And you have the opportunity to filter by tags. Is it um, you, you are interested in one of our personas, so you can filter for that. Are there any specific problems? You filter for that. You then have a list down there with a, a ID for each need. And if you click on the need, you see it kind of listed out like this. As a customer, I need to, so that and because. And we then been able to link all the um, uh, insights and all the transcripts and the videos to that. So it was a, it was a knowledge base. And we've been able to, uh, with that uh, research project, to have 64 confirmed needs. And confirmed for us meant that one need has to appear from three different sources in order to be able to put into the platform. 
So that was a great way to um, share with other teams and provide them with a search function and have an opportunity to go back on, to, on the data. And another one, because we tested a lot of um, templates, we used mapping and tools and diagrams and everything, um, I started uh, writing up the service design playbook last year in October. And it's also a platform. We have currently four main phases, which are represented by our agile framework, uh, live discovery alpha beta, and I will show that to you in a couple of minutes how that looks, but we have nine chapters ranging from analysis to research to mapping and within those chapters you have different plays. So um, yesterday I did a workshop about problem framing, so if someone from our colleagues would need to run a session about problem framing, he could go onto the um, service design playbook, read through what he has to know, why you do it, when you do it, what you have to be aware of, and then download the templates to do the session as well. So this all looks great, but I found that 70% of um, change efforts fail to achieve their target impact for three reasons, because there's inadequate um, resources or budget, which is true. We had a budget, but it was small. It, we always had the feeling that they said, yeah, we don't trust you 100%, so you're not getting the full budget. We always had to ask for stuff. Um, management behavior does not really support the change, and this. Um, has most of the time to do that they might not really understand it or they can't see the full picture. And then the, the highest rate here is that uh, there is an employee's resistance to change and we saw that a lot with um, the platform forms we offered. We wanted people to really um, use it, adapt it, be faster, develop something faster and people then suddenly had to change the way they work a bit and so they've been resistant to it. So that's why you need to support the business to translate the customer, what the customer really needs and to tackle organizational challenges. And when I talk about customers, we also have to help the business to understand what our other colleagues need. So it's not only the end customer. But as an example, the company believes that the customer says, I want intuitive wayfinding. What the customer really says is, I need to find the train now. Or the company believes the customer says, I want clear baggage regulations, but the customer really says is, can I take baby food on the airplane, right? So it's very important to um, help the company, help senior management to kind of get to this adaption stage and say, uh, please understand it, don't come with your jargon, make it uh, adaptable for our people. And when talking about uh, tackling um, organizational challenges, through the process, we kind of found ourselves as a team in between two extremes. So on the right side, from my side, on the left side, from your side, we had people saying, we have too much data and we really don't know what to do with it. And on the other side, we had um, teams saying, we have a limited amount of data and uh, probably a lot of assumptions and we're building too quickly. And then we chose, or well, we used this opportunity, this challenge as a team to say, well, if you have too much data and you don't know what to do with it, that's great. Um, we've got the playbook, we've got the tools, we can help you with analysis, we can run workshops with you, we can help you make sense out of the data you have, and then probably set them up for their next project in the right way to not reach that point again. And we've also been able to say, well, you have a limited amount of data and you build too quickly, you have to stop that now. What we're going to do is um, you do the real, the right research and um, we can help you with this. We've we done that before, see the post-family research example. And um, then we help you set you up understanding the, the right needs and the right businesses, uh, the, the right needs and the right insights for the people. So that was really a, a nice challenge to have. And in order to tackle this organizational challenge, you actually have to create products, processes, and structures to help you, to help the team, to create a, 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 a use set that, other, that the company can use. So I'll run through a couple of examples of how we tried to do that. Um, we did that because we believed um, this will uh, create a direct link between the front line, the people who do the work and the people who work in store and the senior management. Um, we wanted to maintain a single version of the truth. Unfortunately, there are a lot of teams within Tesco who work on similar things or the same thing and there's no one single version of the truth. Um, 
It helped to quickly identify issues and to ensure that our change program, if you want to call it like this, or the change efforts we did, delivered are delivered at the right pace. Sometimes if you're too fast, people get really excited and then you're in a state where, you, yeah, you have to deliver that tomorrow, but it actually takes time to test and validate. And we wanted to, um, it helps to build appropriate skills to ensure that the success continues and that you have a step-by-step -step improvement. So we did that, for example, with the digital design language, which is our um, design toolkit with foundations, elements, typography, colors, um, responsive grid. And the idea behind that was that we said other teams are able to use that resource, um, quickly start designing, designing in a way that it looks and feels as one brand rather, rather than many. If uh, some of you shop with Tesco, you will know that Tesco Direct and Tesco Groceries all look, the, look different as, as web pages because they are separated as businesses. Um, we introduced a mobile app standard, which are seven principles of building and releasing apps. And when I started with Tesco, we had 46 different apps in the App Store, and nobody really knew what the apps are offering. So for us, it was an opportunity to say, let's reduce the touch points um, for our customers and kind of uh, reduce waste as well and resources. We created an agile framework. That's what I said earlier. Um, and uh, we found out that most or all of the products Tesco has are actually in a life state. There's no uh, uh, product which is going to be delivered uh, uh, from a discovery state. So we start always with life where we support your service or your product. And then we identify if there's an issue in there or a problem. And then you would go into the discovery phase where you say, we understand the design problem. In alpha, you would then validate possible solutions. And in beta, you then build a solution and then give it back into the cycle. So for us, it was always a, a cycle in this way. And we use the Agile uh, framework also to uh, start testing how we work. And we have three pillars at Tesco, value, quality, and helpfulness. And how could uh, a common always the same process ensure that we deliver for all of those three pillars. This is currently into testing, so I don't know how, how successful that is and people get it, but yeah, you, you, you build something, you test it, and then you amount, right? So when we work with teams, we also um, found out that whenever we talk about needs and customer journeys and customer customer needs and um, acceptance criteria and problem framings that we had multiple definitions of it within the business. So that's why we created this hierarchy, uh, this needs hierarchy. And how it works is you start with an intrinsic need. Could be, um, I need to feed my family um, because it's not tied to time or a place. That's why we call it intrinsic need. You can fulfill that with multiple journeys. Either you do it online, you do it in store, um, or you get it delivered or something like that. And so you can see different length of journeys. And with the different uh, journeys, you have multiple customer needs and different customer needs. So we, as a business, have to make sure that the acceptance criteria for every need and the problem statements are clear for all the needs so that we can solve the needs you have in order for your journey to be seamless so that you, at the end, be able uh, to fulfill your intrinsic needs. So this is how it works. We tested it, the people get it, and this is then all about repet repetition, going into teams, talking about it all over again so that they finally get it and, and use it as well in terms of how we talk about in needs, journeys, and customer needs. We also thought of how are services and products um, related. Uh, at the beginning, the word services was quite alienated uh, in Tesco. It's a very product-focused uh, company. And with those visualizations, that people get it. So a service could have multiple products, and you could go through within your journey through using multiple products of that service. Um, so that was quite helpful to bring it to life, and people say, oh, OK, I get it now. Cool, let's, let's move on. So, what we also found is that you have to have dedicated roles to provide teams and colleagues with information and uh, ad hoc support and training. This was the service design, or is the service design thinking coach, which I did since January this year. And this was all about training, using the playbook to do the training, um, making sure that I show if I did a nice session and something positive came out of it, then I, I linked that to it. I tracked all the processes, or so I trained 147 people in the last four months, and I know how uh, 
how well they perceived it, if they've been satisfied, if they would recommend it, or, uh, or if people would come for further training or something like this. So it was a great, um, great way to feel the pulse and the needs of the teams and how they really operate to then feed that back up to the, to the company, to the senior management. So a couple of key success factors for change management, infrastructure, mindset and behaviors and capabilities and implementation. And infrastructure is organizing and using assets to um, minimize waste and variances. So we did that, for example, with the digital design language or with the playbook or opening up all those kind of things that people can use it and we don't create new um, similar um, tools and maximize the flexibility on the value chain. So if everybody uses the same tools, we are hopefully a little bit more efficient, which means we don't need that much time, we, we save money. Mindset, behaviors, and capabilities is the way individuals and the company or the organization think, feel, and act. And for me, as the service design coach in Tesco, this was always a great way to understand how people work, think, feel, act, and then if the organization does it in the same or similar way. And the implementation was uh, that you have to have a management structure and process to maintain and manage the operating system. And we did have that with the hierarchy for needs, the agile framework, um, and uh, uh, all the things we introduced into the business. And if you combine all of those three well, then you create change. Um, other success factors, or what is really important is that you need transparent information and a string and progress um, tracking, which are a major characteristics of successful change. And you can put numbers down for that as well. So the availability of information increases the likelihood of success by a factor of four, which means if you're transparent, if you blog a lot about it, which we did, if we um, do pitching sessions or um, week notes or inviting people for presentations, uh, you get much more bigger community who's trusting you and therefore then uh, a higher success rate. And if you have a string and process tracking, it increases the likelihood of your success by seven. And with the training, I, I needed to uh, involve the data and make the business aware of saying, well, I run a really nice workshop. And they said, well, great, Roman, but what is the impact? And I, then I was able to say, well, I can tell you that people now, I increase the knowledge of service design within that session of 30% or something like this. So if you track your process, this will add up to your success. So you might think, Roman, this is all great, but what happened? Well, every little doesn't help. And uh, this is a headline from um, The Guardian from June 2017. And uh, two weeks, uh, two months ago, sorry, this whole process of letting um, colleagues go ended. Um, Tesco let off uh, 1,300 people in total. And uh, their idea was to actually just reduce 25% of the headcount in every team. Uh, but for our team, it was more like 85. And if you remember the slide from the beginning, we actually started like this. So we are back to the start. Um, there was and is still no plan to continue. Um, roles have been shifted and changed and people got offered um, new positions uh, which had very little to none to do with their previous job. And so talent and colleagues did the logical thing of leaving the dark lord of retail. And as funny as this uh, quote is, this is actually how customers feel about us and we kind of got that quote from um, from, from research and uh, yeah, with that note, building it all up, saying it's amazing, we worked on this, we worked on this, but um, Tesco really didn't understand it and let people go and destroyed our structure. Um, I'm at the end of my talk and if someone has questions, I have one and a half minutes <laughs> left. Thank you. <laughs>